and welcome to the 2023 Future of Work Virtual Conference. I'm Balesam Fugeng and I'll be your host this afternoon. It's great to be here with you all. Now, the theme for today's virtual conference is innovation and leadership in a rapidly evolving world of work. The future of work is evolving rapidly and is an ongoing experiment, mostly driven by technological advancements, changing demographics and shifting economic landscapes. Innovation, innovations that were viewed as cutting edge a decade ago are commonplace today. Two years of global pandemic changed the look and location of the tradition of the traditional office rather environments. And while the majority of workers are back at the office, a hybrid work from home component is still clings on for many businesses. Perhaps you are also streaming from the comfort of your own home. As we stand at the cups of a new era, it becomes imperative to understand and anticipate the future of work. First up on today's program, joining us from Dubai is CNBC Africa Executive Director Sid Wahi, who will set the tone for the next few hours. Welcome address by Sid Wahi, Executive Director for CNBC Africa. As we gather here today, we find ourselves at the intersection of innovation, leadership, and the future trajectory of work. This conference is not just an event, but it's a confluence of ideas, thoughts, and visions aiming to shape the future of our professional landscapes. The theme of this year's conference, innovation and leadership in a rapidly evolving world of work, couldn't be more relevant. We live in a time where the pace of change is unprecedented and the need for innovative solutions and visionary leadership is paramount. The past few years have been very transformative to say the least. The global pandemic while behind us has acted like a catalyst accelerating the evolution of work. It has underscored the importance of adaptability, resilience, and a forward thinking approach. Today we will explore the multifaceted dimensions of the future of work. We'll delve into discussions on technology, human resources, enterprise flexibility, and productivity. We'll hear from industry experts and thought leaders who will share their insights and forecasts on the evolving trends and strategies to thrive in this dynamic environment. I invite you all to engage actively, reflect deeply, and most importantly, think innovatively. Together, let's explore the potential pathways to a future where work is more fulfilling, inclusive, sustainable, and resonant with our shared values and aspirations. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Vodacom Business, for supporting this event again in 2023. We would not be here without your support. With this, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Mateto Neati. He's the executive chairman at BSG and a visionary leader who will share his invaluable insights on the visions for an unfolding future of work. Thank you. Thank you, program director. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I will kick off my keynote address by referring to observations that were made recently by Tom Bradley in March 2022. He said, I quote, we actually used to go to work and to offices to work. Like, people woke up, showered, <laughs> got dressed, and fought through rush hour traffic and the challenge of finding decent parking so that they could sit at a desk in a building to do work. Now, people work from everywhere, close quote. Yes, people now work from everywhere, or do they? What is the future of work? What does normal look like going forward? My talk today will focus on answering these very important questions. It will concentrate on what businesses and other organizations need to know about how work could shift, plus how workforces and workplaces can prepare for those changes. A year ago, I invested in a company called BSG. BSG is a business and a technology consulting firm. This is a 26-year-old company known for partnering with clients to help them to implement 
large complex projects. We recently moved to new offices in Rosebank. We call our new offices the BSG Exchange. Yes, this is where we exchange ideas. The BSG Exchange has been designed for the new ways of working. We use our workplace for what we refer to as moments that matter. We had to sit down with our employees to find out what are these moments that matter. And I'm going to share a few examples of what those moments are. Some of those moments are, of course, team meetings. And when you engage with our clients, client meetings. When we're thinking and coming up and problem solving, ideation, problem solving, uh, brainstorming sessions. It's also designed for one-on-one -on -one meetings between a manager and an employee. And of course, our, some of our uh, employees are highly religious, prayer meetings, meditation, uh, the spaces for people to go and think and read and collaborate. It's designed for all of this. At BSG, we use an approach of build, measure, and learn. This approach has served us well as we continuously improve our workplace. We don't have all of the answers, but we have embraced the challenge of change. You can too. So for businesses that hoped to just go back to ways of working as they were before COVID-19, we say to them, good luck. There is no way to put the genie back in the bottle. There is no going back. It definitely seems like the future of work will lean heavily in favor of everywhere workplace. Organizations need to accept that so that they can ensure that they can have the right tools in place to manage and to secure the workplace effectively. This requires leadership. It requires leadership that is uh, open to exploring new ways of working while keeping an eye on the ball that is delivering exceptional services to clients. The balance of power has shifted to employees. We must get used to that. So, Excelling in this new way of working can be a source of competitive advantage in a world where there is war on talent. Thank you for that inspiring address of Mr. Mteto Nyati. He is the executive chairman of BSG. My next panel discussion is on the topic of technological innovation, transformation and automation. Now, organizations are increasingly embracing digital transformation to stay competitive in today's rapidly evolving business environment. Now, this involves integrating digital technologies into all aspects of their organizations, from customer service and marketing to supply chain management and internal processes. Digital transformation enables businesses to be more agile, responsive and customer centric. My guests and I will explore the impact of emerging technologies, automation and artificial intelligence on employment, job roles and work dynamics. And the panelists are Kabelo Makwane, Managing Executive for Cloud Hosting and Security at Vodacom Business, Melvin Lubega, Chairman at Bayobab Group, Ravi Bat, Chief Technology Officer and Director of Commercial Solutions Area at Microsoft Africa, and finally, Andrews Brand. CEO and Executive Director for Manufacturing at Mercedes-Benz South Africa. And a big welcome to my panelists. We have one panelist joining us virtually and the rest of my panel is with me here in studio. And in starting off this conversation, I want to direct my attention to my Chief Technology Officer, Ravi. When we talk about the era of AI and transformation, 
How is this shaping how work is done today? Your perspective. Thank you for the invitation, firstly, and great to be here with the panelists. Um, let me give you uh, some stats about why we are saying the era of AI, right? Um, mobile phones took about 16 years to get to about 100 million users. Internet took only seven. Chat GPT took three and a half months. So it's here. The era of AI is here. And a couple of things which are important to know is today all of us when we go to work and we're talking about future of work are indebted with what we call it as digital debt. Mm -hmm. Information, data, SMSs, emails is going above our head. Our ability to cope with them is difficult. Any normal employee, worker, um, human being who actually debates and deals with these things is finding it extremely difficult. But uh, with natural language prompts, artificial intelligence, and you talk about GPT engines and chat GPT are making things easier. Microsoft is very optimistic that the effect it has on the society, on people, and in industries, on countries, on GDPs is amazing. Now, it is going to change the future of work because what AI is doing to people, it's making people who are good, great. People are finding new ways of productivity. Actually, productivity is getting redefined. And very, very important, this optimism is coming into employee happiness. People are actually enjoying their work because they are finding work a fun thing to do. Now, if you take this or step further, um, as we go into the world of work and future of AI, organizations are re-looking at how should they skill themselves, how do you adapt this, and how does an AI-powered organization look like? So this is how organizations are looking. They're looking at technologies, partners, to help them actually adapt and get on with this world of AI. Now, Ravi, I want to double click here. Digital debt, what do you understand by this? Digital debt is the amount of time you spend querying, searching, and finding information uh, versus creating and delivering s products and stuff. When the balance of uh, that trade uh, goes the other way, you're chasing yourself, trying to get on top of it. What if you get tools to solve your digital debt problem? Okay. That's what AI does. Okay, brilliant. Andreas, do you agree with that? When we're looking into how AI um, technology automation is shaping the future of work, the fact that we are in digital debt, and perhaps we have other perspectives on this. Yeah, I just try to get a different flavor into that space. Um, if you look at the office environment, I'm, I fully agree. But we are employing thousands of people who are building a car. Um, and building a car is a very physical uh, process. But even in that space, we are using AI, we're using technologies. But in some instances, office work is different to shop floor work. It's different to what the dealers do when you get your car uh, to us and we just uh, get it back into the space where it should be when you, when you want to keep on driving it. So wherever you go, work is quite a simple word, but it means different things to, you, to the person you speak to. Coming back to the initial thing, if you look at AI, that is definitely something that will continue um, being around us, but we still have to uh, keep, keep involving our, our people into the process that we call work. Um, shop floor work, um, we are using augmented reality. We had the conversation a couple of seconds ago. We're using augmented reality to launch cars globally at the same time on different locations. So this is not AI, but it's technology. Mm -hmm. This is old school product, but it's future oriented work. So that's what, uh, what we try to do with Mercedes to be on top of, of our people to support them in their daily work. Yeah, and I think that's an important point actually. And I'm gonna continue on the round Robin and bring you in Melvin. Because work means different things to different people and we've got different industries represented here. From your perspective, how is AI, technology, innovation, automation shaping the way that work is done today? It's a very valid point and thank you Tanya. I think it's interesting when you think of the future of work and what technology enables from our perspective. So we run a group of technology companies. And so what we're seeing in our world is a shift where paying someone for time is going to become archaic and it's more so being defined on well-defined outputs. Because the reality is if I can do a task in three hours that took a week before, I shouldn't be penalized for that. 
And I quite like the point that Ravi made where I guess AI and automation is a tool that scales human potential. It won't necessarily replace the human. And so he mentioned that it takes someone from being good to being great. And so in our world, in the same vein, we see it as a tool to enable us to do more towards our mission. And so to the point that was just made, it then affects how we skill our staff. Because I think skilling someone in a world where technology is a tool, AI automation, many other tools like that, it therefore becomes a different, I guess, ambition that we target. But ultimately, we do see a shift both in not being time-based, but more so output and object-based. Habello, bringing you in here. I see you nodding. You're in agreement. <laughs> Absolutely. I think when we think about uh, you know, the use of these technologies and the transformation of work, we cannot talk about it in the absence of, you know, in the context of a fit for future organizations and enterprises. And what we define as fit for future organizations and enterprises are organizations that embrace the five C's, which is using collaboration, using communication, using uh, you know, technology in a way that is responsible, in other words, that's safe. So cybersecurity is a fundamental underp underpinning of this. And connectivity, of course, uh, is the mainstay for you know, some of the use cases that Andreas is talking about in, in enabling uh, this kind of optimized uh, manufacturing process uh, from an augmented reality perspective. But what's also quite key is, we, and what we're seeing from an industry perspective is that organizations are also using the augmentation of machine learning, AI, you know, you know large language uh, models uh, to be able to track and trace their assets more effectively, mm -hmm. to optimize the use of real estate, uh, because you know, the hybrid uh, ways of working are, you know, are, are, are a core uh, element of our, of our ways of working. And of course, not forgetting the fact that you know, the, the, the office is, is everywhere and it's, it's an office in your, in your pocket, which is enabled by mobile uh, and mobile uh, you know, devices, right? Um, yeah. And in that context, what organizations you know, need to be thinking about with transformation of work is how do you bring about agility? How do you make sure that you don't take the lazy approach from a cyber perspective and just lock down the organization, but think about how you can use uh, AI and machine learning in a positive way to enable and enhance productivity. Um, and then last but not least, how to actually uh, build an agile organization. Okay, so we've got quite a few elements here. We've talked about productivity a lot. We've talked about agility. We've talked about how the workplace is shifting. And ultimately, what that makes me think of is also how it's shifting in terms of the jobs themselves and the job market. And I'd like to bring you in on that because you basically have both, where on the one hand there's your offices, but there's also the physical infrastructures. So how do you look at that when it comes to the intersection between technology and humans? How do we collaborate? How do we coexist with the digital space? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting one because in my 5C uh, conversation, I left out the last C, which is uh, consumer, right? And the <laughs> consumer being the employer, <laughs> Uh, the employee, but also the consumer in the context of your customers. So when you think about uh, these technologies, you cannot think about them in the absence of hyper-personalization because that's what they're accelerating now. Hyper-personalizing the work experience, but also hyper-personalizing the, the way you deliver services to your, to your consumers. So bringing them together is actually enhancing the experience and in some cases actually serving a very fundamental thing, which is inclusivi inc inclusivity. I got that out. Um, and, and effectively, when you, th you know, some of the, the, the populations in the work environment, which previously, because of logistical challenges, and I'm talking about differently able people, coming into the office, commuting into the office, and getting through all of that uh, might have you know, posed some very significant physical challenges. And this is just one example from an employee experience perspective. But with remote ways of working and infusing AI you know, uh, technology as well as automation, et cetera, together with the collaboration tools associated, that experience is a much more better experience because they can do it in the comfort of their own home. And, and these are some of the subtle things that we, we often negate, but they are very important. From a consumer perspective, the granularity of what AI can achieve in terms of augmenting you know, search data and accelerating you know, insights um, is, is phenomenal in terms of the experiences that you can deliver you know, for, for consumers, both in the financial services, retail sector, across multiple industries, because now 
no longer do I have to settle for the generic offerings, but I can get tailor-made. Uh, and, and, and sometimes we, we neglect to appreciate the, you know, those pop-outs, that, that, you know, that those adverts on, on search engines and, and e-commerce sites. But this is what hyper-personalization uh, is all about, and it's actually driven in the back end by these AI engines. What about the challenges? What could possibly go wrong when we're talking work across the board, our employees, our teams, our leaders, our clients, our consumers, what could go wrong? Technology advances are at a level of an AI. AI, it's an era of AI. It's a very powerful tool, requires uh, governance, mm -hmm. and the risks and uh, need to be weighed with ethics, and how do we use it responsibly. So the ethics of AI or ethics of tech is very important. What does it do? It, if we can promote across the organizations across the world, the development and deployment of these technologies in an ethical or a responsible manner, that's the first step towards it. In 2017, 2018, Microsoft actually contributed to this whole responsible AI and created core principles on which we obviously um, dwell on and we promote those principles to the entire world. What are those principles? Uh, when we talk about these technologies, they need to be fair. So there has to be fairness in the way they're deployed, that they were developed. Accountability. When you design an AI engine, somebody needs to be accountable for the decisions the AI engine is making. So accountability is very, very important as a principle. Then we go to inclusiveness. You know, you must have heard about the risk of disinformation mm -hmm. and biased views. So you need to make sure that when you're creating these engines and using technology, you are including and being inclusive of everybody and everything. Then comes responsibility. You have a responsibility of developing technologies which don't go out of hand and therefore do it responsibility. You know, I, a couple of days back, I heard this story about AI being told to make paper clips. Did not realize when to stop. So we need to make sure that Paper clip doesn't take over the world. Uh, so responsibility is important. And then very important, and I think Sokapelio talked about this, is these techs need to be safe and people need to feel secured. Mm. Andreas, bringing you in for this one as well, what do you see as risks and challenges to the future of work? If I, if I make it in one word, it's disconnect. My biggest th uh, fear is that people get disconnected. Look at where we are coming from, from the COVID times. We were all sitting at home and all of a sudden we did our life completely digital. Mm -hmm. What was the loss after a year connection? Um, if you go to, to complex tasks, you need connection because I need your input, yours, mine. So we generate something bigger out of the expertise we have. The biggest threat is disconnection. So in other words, what is, what is the challenge? Keep people connected digitally, but also physically. Let's, let's play with, with the options we have. Let's play with AI, AI to reduce workload, to free up capacity for something more relevant. Let's go for it. So I'm not saying one or the other, but stay connected, stay connected as also as a society and as a community. Um, technology will not solve everything, it will support us, but we must make sure also from a leadership perspective that we as a team as a society stay connected. Also globally, by the way, we are not alone in South Africa, we are integrated fully, to the full extent, to a global economy. So let's stay connected globally and locally. Melvin, um, what do you see as the biggest threat to, um, well, actually for leaders, uh, for organizations, when it comes to AI, automation, machine learning, and the future of work? And it comes down to burying your head in the sand. I think you know it's very easy, especially big organizations, leaders, to say AI, chat, GPT, and use them as buzzwords without actually meaningfully engaging with them and asking the question, how does it enable us or an organization to deliver value for our end customers and our stakeholders? I think one of the biggest risks we find, and I think I love the point address ended off on connection, is as Africans, we need to leverage and contribute to the global discourse that is AI and automation. And the biggest risk is us not engaging. Um, I was speaking to a company down in, in Cape Town the other day called Number Boost, and they're in the AI space. And they work with lots of large data models and training these, these, these LLMs that, that we mentioned earlier. And the biggest risk you have is you take an American model, 
which doesn't train on let's say African data and try to apply it directly to a problem. I mean, I remember once came across a, I think it was a young entrepreneur, where they, when they were doing research with models around face recognition. And as an African person, they had to put a white mask on for the machine to recognize their face. And that's often the unknown cost of not engaging. And so as business leaders, it's very easy to do the lip service, not necessarily engaging, but how do you take the technology and make it relevant to your customers? And ultimately, technology is a tool. It's not a panacea, it's not a solution for everything. And so once you realize that, it becomes very powerful because you can engage and disengage as it makes sense. I think that's the biggest discernment that needs to be played here. Thanks for that. And what it makes me think of um, is also the element of security and particularly cyber security. Um, as Malvin just said, it's a tool which can be used for good and for evil. So how are organizations protecting themselves, but also um, doing the whole remote work um, doing the global team management in a secure way? Yeah, look, you know, with, with AI expected to grow in excess of 36% CAGA, the, the, you know, it's, it, it goes without saying that the gene is out of the box, right? Um, and and um, what, what could be used uh, for nefarious uh, purposes by cyber you know, threat actors could also be used uh, to protect the organization in a similar way. So you cannot take uh, you know, uh, knives to a gunfight, unfortunately, mm -hmm. as the euphemism goes, because you know, if the threat actors are using sophisticated large language processing models and AI-driven tools, you, ac you actually have to match that pound for pound. And for threat mitigation particularly, uh, you need to have uh, the ability to trend you know, anomalies at a large scale with very, very large volumes of data. The second, I think, uh, challenge and, and threat is, is uh, typically legislation trails, uh, you know, uh, technology innovation. And I think, you know, in many instances, as we've seen with cloud computing and the proliferation and use of cloud computing in general, legislation is going to play catch up, right? So therefore, topics such as intellectual property rights become quite centerpiece, right? Uh, data veracity, you know, to the point around, you know, uh, that bar, you know that Ravi made around, you know, do you really know that that virtual person that you're talking to is really a real person, yeah. or is it just an avatar that's perpetually driven by an AI machine? And so things like that. And there's been an interesting study also recently with uh, Stanford and MIT, one of the most conclusive ones, uh, which have actually shown that productivity increases for low-skilled workers by almost 35% plus um, versus skilled workers, which is roughly about 15% when you integrate uh, AI in the day-to-day the -day execution of their tasks. So when you think about that, it goes without saying that organizations that are offshoring services or outsourcing or outtasking, et cetera, have an imperative to build future resilience by integrating these technologies. But in the same vein, we also need to use them in order to mitigate against uh, any anomalies and any threats. The future is many things but the future of work will most certainly allow us to step into a new level of competitiveness and opportunities for the continent so a big thank you to my panelists who joined me here in studio today